My presentation is organized into four parts. Uh, the first part really outlines some of the themes that are of importance to me. Uh, they are inevitably selective um, and uh, just sets the context, as it were, for my own work over the last years and still now. Uh, then I will look at what these themes mean insofar as our definition of practice. In other words, I'm going to argue that we need to change the purpose and scope of practice, and ask yourselves, in that particular image, what is public, what is private? What about sanitation? Who owns what? What happens when there's a fire? What kind of technologies are used in the construction of what you see? How do we get the, the rubbish out? What happens when it rains? Who gets electricity from whom and who sells it on? What's the network insofar as hierarchy of electricity? In that particular context, what is community? I think it was Hugh Stretton some years ago who said that when you arrive, wherever you arrive, by which time, when you've looked at these images, at least for architects, most architects will say, I don't understand, this has nothing to do with me, this is not architecture. And I used to feel the same way because I used to think getting into this business uh, was distracting from our core activity, which was to be designers, and I love designing. But then my mind changed, or there were a number of moments, as it were, in my own progress and career that changed the way I think about it. The first was an AIA, American Institute of Architects conference that we were having at MIT when I was teaching there. Uh, and it was titled, The Purpose and Meaning of Architecture. Wonderful. Uh, and in the middle of the debate, uh, I had a colleague who was an anthropologist. She stood up and said, why is it every time architects meet, they talk about the meaning and purpose of architecture? You can either go on doing that for the next 30 years, or you can just stop and become relevant. And I thought, Yes, maybe one stop, stops worrying about uh, the activity that we bring. And I want to come back to that dilemma at the end of the relationship between rigor to our discipline and relevance to the world outside. There seems to be still a big gap, at least amongst my profession. The second change point for me was in a book written by a friend and colleague of mine, John Turner. He wrote a number of books called Housing Without... Uh, not Housing Without Houses. That was my book. Uh, 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 housing by people and one, one or two others. Um, and in it he said uh, that what housing does is equally if not more important than what it is. In other words, you can carry on designing and building houses and that's fine, you have to do that, that's the practical agenda. But what it does in building community, creating a sense of security, uh, generating employment, uh, building a culture of belonging, all of those are equally if not more important. And then I asked myself, well, how can I engage with those themes as an architect? I'm not an anthropologist. And it came to me that we needed to expand the coalition of, uh, uh, of, of, of professionals in dealing with settlements of the kind here. The third change point for me was a statistic that came from the United Nations. Uh, and the UN estimated that something like, and I don't care about the details so much, but something like, 5% of all building work in, in the expanding cities of the South is already, um, is, is actually planned. In other words, you know, it's only a small amount are actually planned through planning processes. If that's the case, I used to ask myself, why is it that 95% of architects go chasing 5% of the work knowing that it's in the other 95% where the real problems lie? That changed my opinion. They said, well, that's fine. I'll work with the 5%. Uh, lots of work, lots of employment. You can go, carry on chasing the other world. So those three things were real change moments for me. Let me remind you, cities, and again I quote from the UN various statistics, and I don't want to spend too much time on numbers because I don't believe numbers so much, but it's good to set just one or two landmarks. Cities in the developing world 
will account for something like 95% of urban expansion over the next decade, two decades. And by 2030, 4.9 billion people will live in cities, 1.4 billion of them in slums of the kind that you see behind me. And those 1.4 billion will be poor or otherwise vulnerable, however you want to define vulnerability. Uh, they will often be, often be discriminated against, uh, socially excluded from city services, from housing, as a result of their ethnicity, their caste, their income, whatever it might be. They will inevitably suffer the instability of work and the insecurity of tenure, we know that. Um, and inevitably also the insecurity of getting the children to work, accessing services and all the other things of health and so on. It's interesting that when we think about it, vulnerability, social exclusion, those two key themes that have undermined all of my work and my teaching are actually everywhere. There's no doubt about that, and some people will say they are increasing, not decreasing. But they are most acute in cities because you don't have the social infrastructure or traditional resources to solve your own problems. You become reliant on authorities to do so. And the authorities are poor often because countries are poor. That's often the sequence. And because there will always be, and I think this is something so important to us all, I don't care about the background, there will always be contradictions in development objectives between the moral obligation for equity, and I remind you, perhaps those of you who don't know, that the UN has linked equity with sustainability in its development work. And not only that, but Tony Judd, a historian, once said, inequity is not just morally troublesome, it's also inefficient because of the trade-offs and all the social exclusion and social problems and infrastructures you have to provide. So there will always be contradictions in development objectives between the moral obligation for equity and the economic objective to attract investment, improve efficiency, uh, and increase productivity. It's interesting. Um, David Harvey, some of you may have read some of his works, writing with reference to the forces which shape our cities today, talks about class power, possessive individualism, the rich elite. He said, and I quote, we increasingly live in divided, fragmented, and conflict-prone cities. The results of this increasing polarization in the distribution of wealth and power are indelibly etched into the, fit, into the spatial structure of our cities, which increasingly become cities of fortified fragments, of gated communities, and privatized public space kept under constant supervision. These issues are also picked up by many others. Uh, I'll just quote one more. Um, many commentators on city form. Anna Minton, for example, in her book called Ground Control, fairly recent book, reflects on the way in which planning controls have been negotiated in order to give the market free reign to turn the city into private enclaves. She says that under the guise of making places defensible and managing safety more efficiently, Behavior is being carefully monitored and controlled. Play is strictly designated to play areas. Public spaces are restricted in use to largely passive activity. Minton's conclusion is that defensible space, and I quote, secured by design, produces isolated, often empty enclaves which promote fear rather than safety and reassurance. It was a nice piece of research done by an architect called Arif Hassan uh, in Pakistan. Uh, it was a report uh, that he printed, that he published in the Architecture and Planning Journal uh, some years ago, in 2007 I think it was. It was a study of Asian cities uh, that were commissioned by the Asian Coalition of Housing Rights. Poor communities are being evicted to make space for elite developments driven by foreign investment. Due to relocation, transport costs and travel time has increased for the most vulnerable, for the poorest. Incomes have been further adversely affected because women can no longer find work close to home. Informal settlements have been densified to make up the extra population and therefore conditions in settlements have actually deteriorated and not improved despite all the development aid that was going on. In the drive for foreign investment, this was again his conclusion, the nexus, that is the relationship between politicians, bureaucrats and developers has strengthened and therefore zoning regulations and bylaws have become easier to violate in the interests of capital, not in the interests of people. 
There was a very nice example he gives in Karachi and many other cities. Um, it was a beachside park was built, which was great. It was needed uh, to create a public open space and recreational facilities. Absolutely great. But in order to do it, the hawkers, the small traders, all the guys who made little things along the side had to be evicted uh, in order to clean it all up, in order to make it more uh, beaut beautified, as they say. Um, the, the, the change in use, again, it was effective uh, for one part of the community, but it excluded the poor from what was going on. For me, it was an interesting example because the park, like so much of city planning, represents an ideal. That single vision of what cities and city places should be like. And this kind of ideal, for me at least, is an expression of expulsion because you have to remove people in order to do it. It's all about eviction, it's all about exclusion, and mostly directed at the poorest and the most vulnerable. And it goes on. This is not something that of the past. It, in fact, people will argue it intensifies. And I don't want to pick on any one country or another, but a few examples. Just listen to this. The Indian uh, Minister of Urban Development said in 2000, that in 2021, his 2021 master plan for New Delhi would be guided by three priorities. I love this. Obliterating the slums, and look at the te terminology, obliterating, that is, you know, move in the military, get rid of them. Places like this, I won't tell you where this is, but it's very close by. Obliterating the slums, uh, developing Manhattan-style skyline, uh, and creating better infrastructure, which is great, fantastic. But again, the terminology is revealing. Um, evictions are, of course, rampant everywhere. Yeah. 400,000 people in Beijing uh, were evicted in preparation for the uh, Olympics at the, in Beijing in, the, in that, that time. 700,000 people in Zimbabwe's Operation Cleanout. And it goes on, lots of uh, places. And it's not just a third world or development context. Um, there was a book recently published called Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City. Uh, and the study of tenants in low-income housing in Milwaukee was one example. And they showed that thousands were put on the street to make way for big developments. Women were most affected, especially single mothers, because uh, they earned less than most others and they had the burden of childcare. Eviction damaged children because the schools and friends kept changing. Uh, and the benefits were cut because where your benefits were sent, the address kept changing. Uh, and you know, the, the actual payments actually got lost as such. So it's not just a third world thing. It is absolutely everywhere. And people will argue that the gap between equity and efficiency, the gap between the poor and the rich, is actually getting worse and not better. Again, in the interest of capital and not so much in the interest of people. All right. Very selective sets of themes, but these are the things that have concerned me because ultimately they reflect on the people that I'm concerned with dealing with, which is the vulnerable uh, and those who are evicted and poorest. So what does this all mean in terms of the three themes that I want to talk about? Mm -hmm.